Good morning. Today we're going to look at the exciting world of all the various technologies available for education and in particular technical and vocational education. I don't know if we'll cruise the super highway of internet or exactly what we'll cover but we'll get a good idea of what's happening worldwide from our panellists today. I'm Keith Harris from the Open Polytechnic in Wellington, New Zealand, and I have three other, well, worldwide colleagues with me, and I'll ask them to introduce themselves, where they work, and they will shed light on the use of the various technologies in technical and vocational education. Firstly, perhaps over to Glenn. We have Glenn, Ricky and Brian. Over to each of you to introduce yourselves. I'm Glenn Farrell. I'm president of the Open Learning Agency in Vancouver, British Columbia. Thanks, Glenn. I'm Ricky Malan, principal of the Technical College of South Africa, known as Technisa. And Brian? And uh, I'm Brian Kenworthy. I'm uh, in the Distance Education Centre at the University of South Australia, which is in Adelaide in South Australia. Uh, I'm no longer involved in technical and vocational education, I'm involved in higher education, but for 14 or 15 years I was involved in technical and vocational education as an administrator and as a person working in distance education uh, in South Australia. And have you had experience throughout Australia? Uh, I've worked at uh, Melbourne University as well as uh, working in, a, and as a primary and uh, secondary school teacher in the state of Victoria. Uh, I, I also spent a, a long stint in uh, Vancouver working, uh, uh, not alongside Glenn, but working alongside many of uh, Glenn's colleagues in Vancouver in the 60s and 70s. So you have seen the uh, introduction of all the various techniques in that time. Yes, yes, I, I've, uh, and I have been involved uh, to some extent with the uh, establishment of the Commonwealth of Learning. I was in at the early stages of the Commonwealth of Learning setting up a plan for vocational and technical education in the Commonwealth of Learning. So I, uh, I have uh, maintained my, uh, my close ties with Vancouver over uh, a long period of time. Uh, another interesting point is I've spent a year on, on Vancouver Island at North Island College, which was a very interesting vocational and technical uh, uh, community college that used distributed open learning techniques to try and get to the remote parts of uh, Vancouver Island. And uh, Glenn Farrell is uh, obviously aware of the work that went on at that particular uh, community college, which was a pioneer in the field of uh, distance learning and open learning uh, in, uh, in British Columbia. In fact, British Columbia is, uh, it's great to have Glenn here today because British Columbia in many respects in the vocational and technical area has led the the world, I believe, in some of the things they do, some of the exciting, uh, innovative uh, activities that uh, British Columbia have carried out in, in uh, not only at uh, uh, pioneering efforts of uh, North Island College, but now with the, uh, the Open Learning Agency in uh, British Columbia has been a, a real pioneer through the various wings that uh, it operates and through the Knowledge Network, which, as you know, is a, a very fine public broadcasting television uh, station that's mm -hmm. part of uh, Glenn's operation. I mean, many sceptics say that uh, you can use all the various technologies in, uh, in the normal academic area, but in technical and vocational education, it's, it, it's, it's not so easy or so relevant. Maybe you could, would someone like to pick up that point? I think it, I think it very much depends on, uh, on the nature of the sort of the, the learning or the training outcome that, that one is after. For example, if uh, you're trying to teach somebody welding, f for example, mm -hmm. it would be pretty hard to avoid a certain component of face-to-face -face, uh, or group in, in, in instruction, uh, practice, psychomotor skills and that sort of thing. How you actually do it. Yeah, yeah. Uh, and, and of course that has to be monitored. Uh, there are things that can be done through self-study uh, through print-based or video or uh, some of the newer technologies, but I think it's a question of balance. Uh. One of the, uh, I mean, one of the characteristics I believe of technical and vocational education is 
particularly in Australia and I think in the UK and, and maybe uh, in, in Canada as well, is that uh, in the technical and vocational area it's becoming more competency-based. Uh, the uh, Because of this move to a competency-based training, it's possible to predetermine the, the required learning outcomes. Now, once you can uh, work out what those learning outcomes are, you can start developing materials, techniques, resources that match those particular learning outcomes. Now, I know you can't do that for all technical and vocational education, but it seems to me it, is, uh, it, it has more relevance to technical and vocational er, uh, education than some of the areas of higher education. There's a tremendous debate going on, I think, in this country, in the UK, as well as in Australia, about this shift towards a competency-based training. And there's been uh, serious misgivings amongst many of the people in higher education, but I believe it certainly does have a place in, in many of the fields of tech voc, where you can predetermine the learning outcomes, develop package materials that then uh, the students can use either independently or as part of a distance education course mm -hmm. or in conjunction with industry at the, in the workplace, working in the workplace with those materials. So it, that's one of the significant uh, characteristics of the field that I think differs from higher education. Mm -hmm. Glenn or Ricky might like to comment uh, from their experience on, mm -hmm. on that. Keith, I want to go to the extreme. From what I saw yesterday um, at the ICDE conference, one of the Australians uh, had a model there where he used television or a video camera uh, for the student and the student had to evaluate his own work in fine arts. So mm -hmm. I want to go to the extreme and say, if we put our heads together, we can do through distance education with the help of technology, any tech voc. No problem at all. No problem mm -hmm. at all. Yes, yes. Uh, it, it's, it's what Brian's saying too, isn't it? You know what your learning outcome is, where you're going. You've got that, and then you can see the most appropriate means of getting there. Whether And, and within that, the most appropriate means of um, going between... What should we call them? Are they tutors? Are they mentors? I mean, the whole role of the teacher is changing with the mm. technologies. Mm -hmm. In fact, it's getting more exciting, not only for the student, but for the teacher. The means of certainly uh, empowering people uh, in their learning, in their vocation, whether it be through distance print packages or through practical tasks on the job. Um, this really is part of a movement to a more client or individually focused education. I wonder how that's being picked up, well, we'll say worldwide. Um, w would any of you like to comment on that in particular? The move away from the institution to the learner directing their own I think, uh, education. I think, Keith, what's happening is that there are, there, there are a number of forces that are sort of causing change, not the least of which is, uh, is uh, sort of increasing demand on, on one, one side in terms of the need for retraining, keeping people up to date, as it were, during the course of their working lifetime, plus uh, uh, reduced public f uh, uh, financing and so forth. And so uh, this is, I think, in many ways resulting in a, a combination of what have we heretofore kind of set off by itself as distance education with a, a number of different kinds of instructional methodologies that have been implied by that and sort of face-to-face -face institutional based teaching on the other. What we're seeing are combinations occurring in order to make learning opportunities more flexible, uh, less costly, more accessible to people. So one may find on in institutions, people studying uh, fairly independently using print or videotape or increasingly CD-ROM interactive technologies. Uh, just the same as you may find people in a remote location having doing that, but plus having some face-to-face -face tutoring. And that calls for more cooperation between the face-to-face -face, uh, colleges or institutions mm -hmm. and the distance or the traditional distance education institutions. Indeed, yes. I think yeah. too, uh, w with, uh, with uh, partners in the private sector, 
I'll, I'll give an example of that. Um, my own organization through our Open College part of, uh, part of the organization uh, is involved in offering a, a, a number of different types of vocational uh, technical programs. One is uh, training of dental assistants. Mm -hmm. Now clearly there needs to be uh, an opportunity for people to practice skills mm -hmm. and under supervision and so forth. But that occurs in dental offices uh, typically on weekends, all over the province. So that actually happens in the workplace. Like I don't open my mouth <laughs> here, and you've got a video camera right. out there in Saskatchewan or somewhere, and uh, say yeah. about stuff. Well, there may be that a video. There there may be a video component as well. Right. But I'm, I'm just making the point that, picking up on Ricky's point about uh, collaborations that are mm. occurring, I think. Uh, that's increasingly important in the in the mix. Yes, and mm. another kind of collaboration the, uh, for ourselves, as an example, is with industry itself, where we make use of mentors who are the trainers or supervisors in mm -hmm. industry, and we appoint them as part-time lecturers to help us with a practical part of the training for our students. And you would train them as mentors. And we would too, train no them. Doubt. That's right. Uh -huh. mm -hmm. Picking up on what Glenn was saying about this shift towards more flexible arrangements and pro probably more accountability. It's been interesting to note that right, uh, right across Australia the, uh, there's been a, a shift from a centralised distance education provider in each state, which used to be the case, to many colleges now getting involved in what we might call open learning or distance education mm -hmm. or flexible delivery. Uh, there's all kinds of labels that people put on these attempts to provide a more student-centred, learner-centred approach. Mm. But we've had uh, the situation where in the past there was one central provider, uh, one distance education college, if you like, for, distance, uh, for technical and vocational education in each state. Uh, in my own state in South Australia, that's moved quite radically towards open learning being provided as part of the normal methodology within mm. each of the traditional TAFE colleges. Uh, Victoria, the state of Victoria is very much the same. So that the, the, the colleges themselves are now moving into providing a uh, different mix of arrangements for their students. Uh, as Glenn has pointed out, more accountable, more flexible, much more contact with industry, much mm. more work based in, in terms of the training they're, 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 they're doing. Glenn also mentioned that the, the uses of technology and uh, the technologies that can be used in, in uh, to, uh, to enable these kinds of approaches to be carried out. Uh, and although I'm now in higher education, mm -hmm. I must admit that within Australia, uh, it's been TechVoc that's led uh, this move towards the flexible delivery of programs, mm -hmm. that's led this move towards the applications of technologies, technologies like uh, video conferencing, for example, mm -hmm. which has been, although it's being now picked up within higher education, TAFE in Australia were the pioneers in the use of uh, video conferencing in the country. For example, in my, uh, my own state of South Australia, we now have a massive network of uh, video conferencing facilities uh, that teaches all kinds of uh, programs uh, to enable a student, no matter where they live, to be involved in business mm -hmm. studies or horticulture mm -hmm. or whatever. Uh, so that the TAFE has really been a leader in this field within the state and, and although higher education are dragging their heels somewhat, they're now picking up on the, the really the pioneering work that I think the, the tech voc area has done within Australia. There's mm. some interesting um, illustrations I think that can be pointed to in terms of how the technologies are changing. I'll give you one example from my own context. About seven or eight years ago we entered into a partnership with uh, two of our community colleges in the province and uh, with British Columbia. Yes, mm. with the assistance of the provincial government uh, who provided some money, we collaborated in the purchase of a large uh, uh, semi-trailer uh, semi that could be trucked around the country and, I and in it was an electronics lab and this was moved around from community to community uh, along with instructors and people would come. It was a mobile classroom, if you like. And that was in response to a, uh, a, a need for, uh, to increase the supply of trained uh, electronic technicians. Now, that sort of thing is being done through interactive uh, video disc. A learner can sit at a terminal and, and achieve all the kind of uh, interactions 
uh, in a, a virtual experience, uh, but equally effective, and, uh, and, and do it on, online or in a learning center. Uh, I find it quite fascinating and how rapidly the technologies are changing the, the way uh, things can be done. What about that, the use of that workshop for practical things? Like you, you quoted the example earlier, earlier of welding. Uh, can yeah. you use that kind of travelling workshop to for automotive mechanics or welding where maybe the you actually want the student to carry out the activity uh, under some degree of supervision, particularly with, with welding, which can be quite dangerous? Uh, have you got experience with using those travelling workshops for that kind of activity? Well, I've never, I've never instructed welding uh, personally, yeah. but I, ha but I've, I, I have uh, sort of a, a, v a view that there are some things, and I think certain aspects of uh, of the training that goes into developing a competent welder would be an example that simply must be done under face-to-face -face or group-monitored situations. Uh, the running of a bead, for example, is something that you can either, you know, do or you can't do, uh, and it, you know, needs to be monitored. And I think if one becomes a bit theoretical for a minute and talks about Bloom's taxonomy of, of, of outcomes, and you know, there are certain psychomotor skills, and welding has a component of that, uh, that can only be done through opportunities to actually practice. And I don't think that the technologies yet can simulate that. Uh, yeah, to the degree that they need We're to. We're virtual but not virtual totality. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> if I may just pick up on that, um, I've seen actually in Australia, unfortunately not in South Africa as yet, uh, some of these uh, autom automobile yeah. uh, workshops that are going around for students. But I want to bring it back just a little back um, in the way of sharing sharing facilities. Uh, there is a possibility of sharing facilities for the practical training, which we need to do, still do in South Africa, because we don't have all of the new technology available as yet. Mm. We share with technical colleges or we share with industry, and uh, they allow our students to just go and use the equipment for training purposes. I think that's... Uh uh, a, a, a reality not just in South Africa. Yeah. I think it's a worldwide kind of uh, reality that is uh, being being recognized in terms of the, the partnerships and, and uh, using facilities uh, in many cases that one can find in, in industry that are far more up to date in terms of equipment and so forth mm -hmm. than in public institutions. Well yes. certainly in New Zealand we would echo that experience too and I think we'll see more and more of this collaboration. Uh, there's the cost factor in there as well. Um, the, uh, the buying of equipment and mm -hmm. that's certainly the South African experience right. uh, is, is prohibitive in some mm -hmm. cases so increasingly this collaboration. And there's a lot coming out of collaboration I think isn't there worldwide in that uh, even the materials we use or have used they're evolving all the time through the sharing we get new examples, different examples everywhere, different cultural perspectives, and that's a great thing. Uh, in uh, tech voc education, um, usually we'll, our students will be the, the people who are in the workforce. What's going on uh, in your country in terms of people seeking uh, what we probably call entry level qualifications, but those people perhaps just coming out of school or perhaps have worked in an area for some time but are trying to take on what we call more entry level mm -hmm. skills. Well, there's, uh, th that's receiving a lot of attention uh, throughout Canada, particularly British Columbia, I think, and, and the label for it at the moment is applied academics. Wh what, what that means is to ensure that people have a certain uh, competencies in the area of numeracy, uh, literacy, communication, problem solving, uh, uh, information technology or information management skills in terms of accessing databases. Yes, keyboard yeah. skills is sort of fundamental to that. So that is becoming a theme uh, in secondary schools but also in what we have called adult basic education in terms of 
these, these sorts of competencies as a platform uh, on which to both seek employment and build other kinds of skills. Mm -hmm. okay. In, in uh, South Africa, at Techniso specifically, we do it in two levels. We've always had uh, an introductory course for students who do not qualify, who don't have the necessary school level entrance qualification. But we're now going lower than that into the ABIT, real ABIT field. What we do is to coordinate once again with different role players, because in South Africa, I think everybody's aware of that, uh, ABIT is, is the most important thing, I would guess, at this stage. And, and we are totally at a loss because of the large number of people that we need to look after. So there are many stakeholders, many role players that already offer ABIT. We do too at technical colleges and we do at distance ed education as well. So we're trying to play more, than, uh, more of a coordinating role to get different role players together and then issue them with a, a Technisa certificate. And then the student would be able, that this is basic skills, yes. then the student would be able to go into our elementary course and get further skills like keyboard skills and little more communication skills, that kind of thing. With, uh, it, it's interesting that with the massive uh, black population in South Africa uh, and the really the, the need for uh, training or retraining many of those people and many of those members of the black population, mm -hmm. uh, there's, I had a conversation with uh, uh, Professor uh, Bengu, who's the Minister for Education, who made it quite clear that the number one priority for South Africa for the future was the, the whole technical vocational area, the need to train technicians. Mm -hmm. With such a, a massive population and so widespread, it seems that distance education is going to be extremely important mm -hmm. to be able to carry out that, uh, that pre-entry, if you like, to develop those entry-level skills to get people into training. Where you've got huge numbers. Yes, but not, they're not just huge numbers, they're so widely spread across South that's Africa. True. The distribution's now, important as well. That's mm. right. Now, it seems to me that uh, Technisa is going to have to play a major mm. role in getting those people up to entry level if they're going to get into the technical workforce. Mm. Is that correct? That's, that's absolutely right. Um, the Reconstruction and Development Plan in South Africa, which mm -hmm. you probably also know about, will fund adult basic education. And, uh, well, not only Technisa, but Technisa will definitely play a very large role being distance education. Mm -hmm. uh, as I mentioned, also a role of coordinating because there are many, many providers at the moment because the need is so big. The numbers are so large. So we definitely are very, very busy with that at the moment. I think, I think one, of the th one of the things that's important in this is to go back to an earlier uh, point that was being made about competency-based because so often uh, <coughs> excuse me, basic skills have been defined by the courses you have taken mm. as opposed to the competencies that you can demonstrate. And uh, it seems to me that, uh, that that's a fundamental shift because if you focus on the competencies that a person can demonstrate, however they may be defined, then it really doesn't matter how they acquire them. They can acquire them on their own through self-study, through wor uh, 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 experiences in the workplace, through formal programs offered by a, uh, the, the flexibility that is enabled by focusing on outcomes rather than inputs mm -hmm. is quite, quite profound, I think. So you're talking about uh, basically recognition of prior learning. Yes. So that needs to be... Uh, I think it has to be a, a component that comes along with this shift that we're, mm -hmm. we're seeing. How, how's that being done in Canada? Right? Well, it's being uh, being done uh, in, a, in a variety of ways. In the province, we have uh, sort of developed a set of standards in terms of procedures through which competencies can be, can be assessed. In my own organization, we have a credit bank so that people can have skills assessed and, uh, and then have that recorded. And uh, it enables people to to ladder, if you like, uh, learning experiences, uh, build a one upon the other that may move them from a technical diploma at some point to, to a degree in technology. 
May I just connect with what Glenn is saying now with the word that was mentioned earlier, I don't know by who, but that of retraining. And it's so important, the shift towards outcomes based is very important for the retraining of teachers and lecturers and mentors and everybody in the tech voc field. And I think the two processes that run concurrently now is the most important thing because if you don't have your trainers in line with outcomes based mm -hmm. um, ideology, yeah. then, then they cannot take charge of this large group that just, needs. Just to uh, underline that point, uh, I don't know about your, uh, your uh, experiences, but at least in Canada, the whole notion of apprenticeship training mm -hmm. is being revitalized. And uh, as, as one of the strategies through which to deal with the kind of demand uh, for enhanced competencies in technical and vocational areas, one of the things that's being focused on, my own organization is involved in, is the, uh, the uh, upgrading of the skills of the, uh, the journey persons who are going to be working with uh, apprentices in a given trade so that their skills in terms of uh, teaching and learning and so forth uh, are enhanced because historically that's something that's not been, have had much attention paid to it. Yes, yeah, so it's quite interesting. It's almost generational in some ways. There's the, um, there's the realisation of um, the huge shifts that the current teachers have to make in competency based and so on, but many of them are not uh, computer literate as well, and I think they fear the future a lot. But Very we've got all much. got generations coming yes. through who are highly skilled, in, I mean, it might have started with the spacey games, but now they're very screen literate, cybernetic junkies or whatever, and uh, the, the, the knowledge and so on is very, that needs to go to them is very often with teachers who quite often uh, fear the technology or having real trouble keeping up mm. with that. Um, perhaps we'd like, well, I'm not, we've focused, been fairly wide ranging in our discussion, perhaps uh, we could say are there some areas that have presented or what areas present the biggest challenges in technical and vocational? I mean sometimes we avoid that word problem but let's call it challenge. What are the, what are the really hardest things? Well let me put one on the table. It okay. doesn't have to do with instructional technology. It has to do with the I think traditions that we live by that have led to distinctions between education and training, uh, between technical, vocational and academic and so forth that in my judgment are increasingly less valid if they ever were. Uh, so the challenge that, uh, that we're facing uh, is to look for ways to enable people who have uh, acquired basic skills, who have a technical vocational, who want to go on and do something at a higher level, if you like, to be able to have what they've done recognized mm -hmm. as a platform on which to build, and if that means getting then more uh, academic experiences in order to build toward a degree, that that's fine and that's appropriate. So it's the articulation process and dealing with fairly traditional and ingrained perceptions about what that means that is, I think, the biggest challenge. Uh, picking up on that point, uh, it's also, that's also a challenge in Australia, the articulation of what happens in tech voc uh, into other areas, if you like. For example, the guy who does, or the person who does engineering mm -hmm. uh, and gets a tech voc qualification may want to move on to higher study and then finds that there's no articulation between what uh, he or she has done uh, that leads on to a higher award if they want to do a higher award. Uh, there's arrangements now putting, being put in place within many institutions to set up links between higher education institutions and the tech voc area so that there is recognised articulation across a whole range of fields, whether it happens to be a, a dental technician moving into dentistry or an, uh, a welder moving into engineering or whatever. So it's, it's become a big issue in Australia, this articulation uh, from not only the awards within TAFE, but the work-based experience into uh, more formal accreditation if that's so desired. I'd like to pick up on another, uh, uh, there's another problematic area uh, I think that, that's happening in Australia at the moment. We ha we're facing a situation 
where there's a much, much more require, requirement for work-based training. Uh, there's much more accountability. Mm -hmm. Students are becoming uh, uh, more concerned that what they're doing is uh, relevant to their future employment. And with de deregulation of the tech voc area, we're having more and more private providers coming in. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. The student is not concerned so much about the certifica certification they get from a, uh, Institution X. They're more concerned that they've got skills that make them employable at the end of the training. So uh, unless our technical and vocational colleges in Australia really pick up the, uh, the challenge of providing uh, work-based activity, relevant training, student-centred training, resource-based training, the private providers are going to, to move in and take over. Now I think that's probably happening uh, uh, on a worldwide basis. It's probably mm. happening in Canada and I'm not sure it's about South Africa. But it certainly is uh, it's something that offers a challenge to the uh, traditional TAFE colleges within Australia to really pick up their act, otherwise they're going to fall by the wayside. Mm. I want to agree with, with what has been said so far. I think a further difficulty, and this is particularly for South Africa and I don't think so much for my colleagues here, is that we've been locked into a curriculum that is not industry driven, not completely industry driven. Mm -hmm. And that was a really problematic area which is now moving towards a more industry... That uh, was too rigid. It, w it used to be too rigid. And not practical and now enough. Well, I, c I can't say that, but it wasn't exactly what the client wanted or mm. uh, it wasn't what was it really needed. It wasn't skills based, skills and outcomes based mm -hmm. enough to, to be the right thing. But we're moving towards that now with the National Training Board and the strategy that they have and uh, National Qualifications Framework. Um, yeah. All of that movement that's going on in South Africa at the moment is bringing us closer to what industry really requires of institutions. I think that's, uh, that's a worldwide sort of phenomenon. Let me put another challenge that, uh, <coughs> that I think we all, we all face that that's speaks to the issue of why this basket of so-called distance education strategies and methodologies have been historically historically sort of or at least to date less less applied to sort of basic skills or technical vocational than they have been to academic uh, in my view I don't think it has anything to do with the appropriateness of those uh, pedagogical techniques to d to helping people develop basic skills or technical vocational skills it has to do with what societies in the developed world have valued and they have valued degrees and academic Absolutely. more than they have the basic skills mm. and so we've seen open universities etc develop uh, as, as the leading edge I think what we're s what we're experiencing now and I suggest it's a worldwide phenomena is that if one compares the need between academic and the need for basic skill development and technical vocational skills that are relevant to the workplace, it's like comparing a watermelon and a lemon in terms of degrees of magnitude. And so we are in the throes, I think, of a, a fairly massive uh, uh, development and, and translation of these uh, distance education strategies to address the problems that we're all facing in terms of developing competencies in our workforce. Yes, and, and many of these, uh, there's government money. Is this the experience is flowing that way as well? Is that certainly your true experience? in Canada? It's true in New Zealand. I, I, yeah, I don't think it's, it hasn't been as true in Australia because um, technical and vocational Australia has always had a, a, a history of development in, uh, in, uh, in distance education. They've always been at the forefront of distance education. Um, I, although I agree with Glenn on a global sense, I don't, th and one only, only has to look at developments like the open universities all over the world, whether, whether it happens to be Sri Lanka or Pakistan or wherever, they are all focusing on, uh, on higher education. Australia seems to me to be a peculiar beast in that uh, we were involved with distance education in tech at a very, very early stage. So there hasn't been so much 
differentiation, if you like, between higher education and, and the TAFE sector. In fact, one would have to say that TAFE was a lot more innovative, uh, a lot more technology driven in what they were doing than the higher education sector ever was. Uh, but one uh, looks at South Africa, for example, and, and uh, up to this point in time, it's very much been uh, a higher education that's had the emphasis on, on, uh, and on uh, distance education and Technisa has probably been the poor cousin, I think, to UNISA up to, the, up to this point, but that's <laughs> certainly going to change. I don't, know whether, here. I don't know whether that's accurate or not. You but I disagree with that. I, I think that's <laughs> certainly going to change in the future. Uh, is that correct? I'm waiting for my chance to answer you. <laughs> <laughs> I think, in fact, uh, you are right in a way that uh, higher education uh, received first attention and that's now sort of on the way in the new dispensation. TechVoc is very important for, for uh, our government and we get all the support and then distance education as a delivery mode is extremely important for the government because they realise that's the only way in which they can cope with the enormous problem we have in South Africa. But then distance education to cover all aspects of education, uh, not only TechVoc, but uh, TechNISA has been identified as one of the institutions to play a very important role, which we are already to a large ex extent fulfilling. But I want to point out just another uh, matter, and that is that on the part of industry, and our clients, it's much better to deliver by means of distance education because it's so much cheaper for the client. Now the student doesn't have to go to college full time any mm -hmm. longer and through co uh, co cooperation with industry, we make some kind of an arrangement like I mentioned earlier on and it's much more cost effective for our clients. So uh, in some ways what we're saying uh, politically, the time has come. Um, and the support and the flows are happening. Absolutely. In South mm. Africa, politically, the National Open Learning Agency will be formed before the end of the year mm -hmm. to coordinate all open learning and flexible learning and distance education and all of that. Mm. The um, technologies we've sort of discussed in each of the different countries, but uh, in many ways now, you can, or certainly in New Zealand, you can get a, an MBA from Henley here in the UK. What do you think is going to happen, say, in each of your countries where uh, will people tend to go for offshore um, qualifications or tickets and so on, rather than stay locally? I think one of the things that will limit that in the area of, or w uh, let me put it this way, I think, it I think the global phenomena will develop more slowly in technical vocational than it has uh, and, and, and will in sort of the, um, the more academic areas or even the basic skill areas. The reason for that is that uh, uh, the uh, national or state and provincial jurisdictions frequently specify particular kinds of requirements that are unique to that area and so while there may be some generic things that can be done one still if you want to be licensed uh, as an auto mechanic in British Columbia you're going to have to meet British Columbia's uh, requirements. The other thing that negates against that in, in, in Australia for example would be I mean, there's obviously an investment being put into the government for training people at the local level within each of the states. I mean to get offshore training is obviously going to be a lot more expensive than, uh, than using the homegrown product. Uh, one could uh, perceive that if there was a particular course that one wanted to do from the UK or from Canada, uh, there might be some specialised courses that people would enrol in and uh, do on the internet or using the World Wide Web or by using video conferencing. But I think uh, the future, e even the future in the next 10 years, most of that training, I would assume, would be done within Australia simply because of the costs involved that the, the student, unless they really required something specialised that wasn't offered within the country, would probably be, be, uh, be doing a program that was being developed and, and uh, delivered within their own country. However, having said that, I mean the, the technologies do enable these kinds of activities to occur. You might be running a course within Australia 
that then utilises through the technology something that Glenn's doing at the, the OLA in, in Canada. You might build in specialised arrangements uh, to tailor to a particular need where we set up joint activities, where there is collaboration on a global sense I rather think, than... I think one of the things that will drive that is the, the uh, move toward multimedia-based uh, uh, instructional products. Yes, yes. These are costly to develop. Nobody should be uh, misled about that. Uh, and, and the front-end investment will require collaboration and cooperation mm -hmm. and sharing. And there are all sorts of generic materials. Take electricity, for example. It tends to behave pretty much the same regardless of what country in the world you're in. Uh, so a, a multimedia instructional package uh, would obviously be applicable uh, anywhere. Mm -hmm. uh, and you'd develop right. there. Well, South Africa might develop something in the... I think, I, think, I think we'll see that happen, but it, it, at the moment it's being very much led by the private sector as opposed to the public sector. Yes. Mm. Yeah, th there is a danger in that, Glenn, of course, that it, uh, not a danger in the collaboration, but a danger of the private sector activity, that um, the products developed by the private sector with very little input from people like uh, OLA or uh, from uh, uh, South Africa or, um, or ourselves, that. Uh, it becomes a, a Microsoft Bill Gates product that uh, goes into every technical and vocational college in the world <laughs> with very little input from the, peop the, the people who are delivering the program and from the students themselves. Uh, I mean, I much prefer a collaborative model between institutions, but with the other may be foisted upon us. Can you see a future like that, Glenn? I can very much see a future uh, uh, in that, that is will more and more be led by uh, by, by private sector investment. And I, I disagree that it will happen uh, in the absence of student input because one of the things that the that industry knows far better than those of us who have toiled for our careers in the public sector is how to uh, put the customer first. Mm -hmm. And it's these kinds of, the development of these kinds of products, uh, particularly in the training and vocational area, technical vocational area, is very much focused mm -hmm. on uh, you know whether or not it works for the consumer. Yeah. There's, some, oh, sorry. there's some cultural qu questions in there too as well. I mean we've been having a discussion over the weekend here in Birmingham uh, related to this whole cultural imperative in terms of developing materials that you can use in India, Australia, Canada, New Zealand, South Africa mm. and mm. what's culturally uh, uh, appropriate for a particular uh, area of the world may not work somewhere else. So mm. there, there needs to be, I think, some uh, thought about how those materials in a, being produced in a collaborative fashion work culturally within another mm. in, in institution or country. Absolutely. I want to look at this question from another perspective. Uh, having been isolated for a long time, I think in South Africa we as a people, and I'm generalising now, as a people tended to look at South Africa for everything we need. And we have grown to produce our own. Uh, we're not so keen to go overseas for qualifications. But I think as technology develops and as we get on the super highway and as things develop, we will gradually um, get into that and make more use of, of overseas, for us overseas qualifications so the, the and training. The uh, super way will become the um, supermarket shopping shelf to get the best of whatever particular I think topic eventually. or angle. So yeah. we can pick and mix the mm. world over, yeah. Yeah. but within the cultural constraints. Mm. Mm. Well, <laughs> we seem to have drawn out a few common themes, haven't we? We've uh, we're seeing a lot of boundaries disappear between not only between institutions, between private and public, uh, and between industry and the traditional institutions. So whether that Jericho trumpet's being blown, uh, I don't know. The contact classroom, uh, their walls are coming down as they're going more into what's traditionally been distance and so on. The technologies are shrinking the world in many ways. Um, distance has so many meanings now. It's a very exciting time and these technologies uh, have been, their capabilities have been recognised 
Um, have you all got some final comments along those lines about where you see the future, where we are, um, technical and vocational education, the, um, how are you seeing it? I believe that, uh, you, as you put it, the Jer Jericho trumpet has been blown and the walls are starting to tumble down, certainly applies in Australia to technical and vocational education. Certainly doesn't apply to the area I come in, in higher education, although <laughs> my own institution is, I, I came from a distance education centre, it's now called a flexible learning centre as of a few weeks ago. We're moving uh, across the whole of the uh, academic areas within the university to provide uh, use distance education techniques and face-to-face -face as well of our distance education program. But getting back to Tech Voc, uh, in all states of Australia I see the walls coming down, uh, colleges becoming more open, cooperating a lot more with industry, mm -hmm. using uh, student-centred approaches for their training where they mm -hmm. have students working with industry, working within the college, working within libraries, working within their homes. Uh, providing programs that are not just a distance education program but a, a mix of a whole range of flexible deliveries. And uh, that seems to be happening quite generally in the TechVoc area uh, in every state of Australia with some very, very innovative uses of technology. So I, I think the future is very rosy for, uh, for TechVoc in, in my own country as well. Right. Great. Ricky? I want to say that the future is very rosy for TechVoc. TechVoc, to my opinion, has taken the lead in all these uh, wonderful words that we use these days, access, uh, recognition of prior learning, yes. skills, uh, outcomes based, uh, which are equally applicable to any other kind of education. But uh, TechVoc has taken the lead in this. And I've, on top of that, I've, I must add this, that I've, I feel that in distance education, we've sort of jealously guarded our <laughs> mode of delivery and we're going to have you to mean let go. You mean we're sinners too. We, that's <laughs> it. And we're going to have to let go because that, that is a mode of delivery um, to be mixed with face-to-face -face in different other ways uh, that will be used throughout TechVoc for the success, the ultimate success of TechVoc. I just, I just uh, underscore what, what Ricky said. To me, whether we're talking uh, CD-ROM or interactive video conferencing or print or face-to-face -face instruction of some sort, these are all tools in a sack from which we draw depending on who our learners are, what are their characteristics, what is the outcome that is intended, and how much money do you have? Because that shapes what what we do. So this this notion that uh, the, the 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 methods of distance education are uh, appropriate here and inappropriate there, I think, is not a very helpful kind of uh, distinction to make. It focus on the outcome and the learners and make your decisions. And you can't go wrong. Really. <laughs> well, it might be a good uh, place to close. So th thank you everyone for your contributions. Um, it's an exciting world out there and it seems increasingly to be not a world so much as uh, of competition but a world of saying how can we do the best for our learners and in doing so a lot of old barriers are, are melting away and everything's taking on new forms. Yes. Okay, I'm feeling optimistic about it. <laughs> <laughs> I'm sure we'll meet the challenges yeah. worldwide. Mm -hmm.